Hi everybody, and thanks for tuning in again, this is Alfredo. So lately I've been sort of toughing out a virus at home, and before you think about it, no, it's not that virus, apparently. So, well, I've been, I've been resting at home, and I've had a lot of time to do a, a lot of soul searching and sort of reflecting on the past. So, today, um... I wanted to sit down and put in words a certain story that uh, I actually have never talked about before anywhere online. And the reason why I'm doing this is that I think that there's a lot of people in a similar situation right now that need to listen to something like this. And if you are that person or if you know that a person like that, I hope that you are, you know, I hope that you're willing to share this so so it reaches the right ears. But back when I was 21, um, well, I grew in a very complicated household. I loved them so much and I truly wish and I want to try to educate them a little bit better on the right path in life. But they have proven to be very difficult to dealt with over time because they didn't really listen to reason and that's the that's one of the many reasons why I decided to to leave the country and move elsewhere to work. And the it turns out that my family when I was twenty one, well, um we had a very conflictive sister who constantly tried to give us grief and back then this one night I was just minding my own business and it turns out that she started fighting with my mother because she needed money for she's always asking for money and she doesn't work because she is really lazy so it turns out that this one time things blew out of proportion and she started fighting my mother and I held her hands back to try to not have her um, punch my mom. Because it got to that point. It got to the point where knives were involved or where punching was involved even. So after she did that, um, my mom ended up calling the police because we live in this neighborhood where usually you had patrols around the place and all and um, after she called them uh, they came around and they picked both of them up my mother and my sister and once me and my father who doesn't who didn't live with us then uh, he and my mother are separated so once he swung over to try to figure out what had happened and once we decided to try to go visit them whatever they had taken them so they ended up once they noticed that I had arrived at the place and that I was related to that case they ended up um, well pulling me aside to try to ask me some questions and they claimed that my sister had falsely accused me of punching her that I had violent uh, that I had practiced violence against her that I hadn't held her hands back, that I had actually hurt her by doing that, and that my mother was in cahoots with me for that violence, and so that we had conspired to hurt her. And a very bad thing about the legal code in Mexico is that violence against women is sort of something really reprehensible, and if a woman accuses you of that, well, you have no defense. So right there and then, I remember that they brought out handcuffs. And they had handcuffed me, and I was turned in. Uh, I was in prison after that. So I remained in prison for two days. Uh, I have no criminal record or anything, but. It was probably one of the most daring, if not the worst, experience that I've ever had. 
and it hurts particularly well it doesn't hurt now I've made my peace and I hold nothing against anyone but it hurt back then because this is my family that we're talking about so you will expect them to be decent towards their own kin quote unquote even though I've realized now that such a thing doesn't really matter in Mexico where everybody's just looking after themselves apparently so they took me in and they I remember walking those aisles I remember walking those corridors and it was awful and the place smelled awful and it looked awful and they made me remove my shoelaces and they also remove all of the things that I had on my body as in I don't know uh well usually if you had something like a chain or something you have to drop it somewhere and you're basically walking around the place with untired shoes and then they brought me into this inspection room with me where me and like other four people uh we we were we stood up in a row and we had to strip naked and they cavity searched us so we wouldn't sneak anything into the prison as in drugs or maybe a weapon or something and i remember that the officer there he was he was terrible and he looked he looked awful and he had like this demeanor where you couldn't look him in the eyes because he had like really small and really really closed eyes like almost as if squinting his face was all red and greasy and and like it looked like clumps of or, 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 or like a tomato for lack of a better word but he had this demeanor and this tone of voice that was like horrible like he was like he was gone like he didn't give a shit anymore about anything he was just there to do a job and to do it as vehemently as possible so and he starts talking up and he has this really irritating tone of voice and he compels us by almost like pushing us to strip naked and cavity searches us because well they had to ensure that nothing would get by and so and and bear in mind this was the first 15 minutes of my imprisonment and this is already awful to begin with so I get put into this communal cell and there's these couple guards just walking around the place because it was the middle of the night then it was like almost 1 a.m. or something and this guard going around the place so he sort of notices me and he sort of realizes that I don't really fit there so he starts like asking me questions as what what did you do why are you here and I remember that I told him like hey man I did nothing my sister falls me accused me and so the guy he he realizes and I and I think that he was kind of you know he was kind of like worried or my words touch him in a way so he goes and he gets me a blanket uh, of course the blanket was terrible it was one of those really cheap tarape like ones and it smelled terrible it smelled like pee but he brought me that and he told me to just like rest and just wait until everything tides over and so there I am like a fucking dumbass just like place was super cold and it, and it smelled terrible the smell of feces the smell of urine and it was cold it was this i was in this part of the prison that was this huge area a communal cell a communal cell again and everybody else was sleeping back then so i tried to sleep for the rest of them but i couldn't sleep. uh i just kept looking out of one of the small windows on the top and I just saw the sunrise to that I was not able to do that night because I felt so I felt very very upset about everything that had happened so then 
once the morning came. So everybody sort of wake, woke up and they realized that I was new there. And so so you have all, all of the other cronies there. So they have the usual kind of demeanor that a no-gooder has. And so they start like trying to give me grief and they were like this really fat and really awful person. And he questions me, what did you do? Why are you here? And so on and so forth. And and then I look across and my mom was sitting at the other end of the place and she's doing like this, like saying hi, like this, hi. And the guy's like, hey, um, ma'am over there is like saying you hi, has she's got a thing for you? Is she like, and I was like, I don't want to listen to him this. I try to not talk to him. But I was very awkward, I guess. And he just started like pushing and pushing and pushing a bit more. And, like, and then he started like rubbing himself underneath his shorts. Like, you know, just for pocket pulling himself into things. And and that was sort of like, oh, that lady over there was, well, she's kind of kinda hot, dude. Oh, I wish, I wish that she was that friendly to me. Maybe I should, you know what? Oh my god, I cannot deal with this with this Olympic amount of bullshit right now. So the guard from earlier, he sort of realized that, oh man. And he took me away and he put me in a personal cell. Um and I guess that made it a little bit better, but I still had to pass the whole day there. And the next day they uh yeah, I mean, I had to, well, uh, the rest of the day you spend it there in the cell, just basically just laying down. I didn't eat anything. I didn't want anything to eat. Uh, they told me that they had this kind of weird powder egg kind of thing where they put water on a kind of substance and it, and it pops off and it's scrambled eggs now. But I didn't want anything to do with it, honestly. I just wanted to get out of there. And I had a terrible time that day. I remember one of the most bizarre things there. It was like this square complex, imagine. Where the center of the complex was a, a stair set that went down like a spiral. And but on the main area... You had like a bunch of cells, there was a big cell that was for women and a big cell, a communal cell for men and a lot of other individual cells. But something that was very bizarre is that there was some kind of, there was this guy who I think that he was living in the prison. The, he had the prison to himself as sort of like a personal home. He had a TV, he had amenities, he had furniture, he had all, all of the stuff. But it, it it still it was very much a cell, mind you, and he had privilege, free privileges to walk in and walk out whenever he wanted, and he had a job there because he cleaned the place, and every guard and every police person they will ask him for errands and he will go on errands, and he was like a like a pal to them of sorts. That was incredibly bizarre, I guess. So I don't know, I guess maybe somebody, or maybe he was some kind of prisoner who had come to some kind of arrangement with the people there. That was incredibly bizarre. And so I didn't speak for the rest of the day. I just decided to spend time in that cell. And I passed the night, and I remember that I woke up the next day, day two out of two. And... I mean, I was sort of like a really fucking bad of it all, and um, and then they decided to take us to like another prison, which was a family prison or family tribunal of sorts. I don't really remember. The idea was that supposedly that was a place where we could go through the rest of the process to see if either charges were gonna be pressed against any of us by any of the parties or if they wouldn't so they drove us there and there was like this smaller cell where we had to 
I was like there were like other eight people, so it was like really awful. There was this other really fat guy. He had like some kind of diabetes, and he elbows were like rotting, rotting away. He, they were like all brown and like a small scars on them that looked a little bit full of pus and um and most of them it was just the usual hey what are you in what are you in here for man oh i picked i pick pocket at such and such in morelos which is morelos is the name of the main commercial Monterey, my hometown so and this other guy was like well so i fuck such and such but she was such and such his daughter and he called the cops and 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 I, and I and I really didn't want to do anything, all of that. They were incredibly, incredibly disagreeable characters. And then, so the day after, uh, well, in this second prison place, um, I remember that uh, when we were drove there, the police people on the truck, they were like this again, like the guy from the beginning. They were like these two really tall and really awful guys, really chunky guys. They were like, like they had these demeanors where you just know that there's nothing nice in their souls anymore. They just pretend that they own the place and that they have a, a carte blanche for everything. So I remember that he, another truck, because in Monterey, patrol cars or trucks and they load up people in the back on the on the on the trunk. And but anyway, so so he and another person they they rest they raced each other, him and another police officer. And they were like <sighs> like you know I think that they easily did like a hundred twenty kilometers per hour. I don't really remember the equivalent in miles per hour but they would speed just because they felt that they had the authority to do so and i and i and i and i hated that i hated living through that because for a couple moments i was like oh man these guys are terrible at driving and stuff and i was so 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 fed off and all that and then so we were at this other minor prison place right so that was the place where the family prison place. So that was the place where you know, if I could, I could have hired a lawyer and sort of defend myself out of the place. But I didn't really have that kind of resource back then. Not to mention that I had no idea where to start, if so. And nobody from my family really visited us. My aunt, my aunt visited us. But there was nothing that she could do, really. And she knows that uh, my mother and other people in my family, that they're, they're up to no good, so it's useless to help them. So I remember that I got brought into this place, I don't know, for some kind of office process or something. And I had to wear an orange jumpsuit kind of thingy. Um, it's like sort of those coats or one of those rather best that construction workers use rather not a jumpsuit so i remember that I, when i did that i had to go in and i was like i was like i had i was handcuffed so i had to walk in that way and the whole process was incredibly humiliating so um so when that happened is that um so after all of that happened i don't remember exactly why but um yeah I, they, they decided to let us go after a certain time because supposedly nobody pressed charges not even my mother who prison and so once we walked out of there my mom and my sister started started chanting christian hymns hymns like because they are incredibly religious much to their chagrin 
in. And so they start rambling like, yeah, praise Jesus and praise God because we're all that prison and all that. The fact that they got themselves into that issue notwithstanding and very unfortunately. And so they start like blaring out, yelling religious shit and all that. My father had gone and picked us up. He's a, he's a taxi driver or was back then. And so when I, um, when he picked us up, uh, I asked him to lend me his cell phone and I spoke to my siblings at home, particularly my sister. And I remember that my sister asked me whether I was okay or not. And I remember that at a certain point I didn't, I couldn't even master the words to talk to her about what had happened. And I sort of just geared up and I started like weeping for a bit and I decided to call her later because I wanted to collect myself first bear in mind that my mom and my sister were still and at this point kind of condescendingly giving me attitude about how lucky I am to have been freed because of the glory of the Holy Spirit and stuff and so for the rem for the rest of the trip, I didn't even talk to them because I had had enough. And so that's why, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because, well, this is a period in my life that taught me a lot. And it taught me that your family doesn't define you. What your family is up to, it doesn't have to be what you're up to. Excellence matters. Having talent and exploiting it matters. Trying matters. Building things and making an effort matters. And I decided that I didn't want anything to do with them. I moved out of that house some weeks later. And I moved out for good. One day, my sister stole a Nintendo 3DS from me. She pawned it off. And to this day, she keeps doing that, pawning off stuff, because she uses the money to fuel her addiction. And, and so, after she did that, I decided to go pay back the money so I could recover that stuff. I walked it into my house with a bag that I... a makeshift luggage thing that I managed to purchase somewhere. I just put in all my clothes and I walked out of there and after then, not even once, I've slept in that household. I just went out and moved out without any prior planning, without any other measures. I just moved out and never looked back. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because of all of those reasons that I mentioned before and also because when somebody asks me if it is too hard or if it is too bad for me to undergo duress or to be put through the ringer because of everything that I'm up to or because of the conditions of living that I have. Every time that that happens, I know that I had it worse and I know that I made it through and I made it to, and I made it through to great effect. And that's why I don't take shit from people because everybody who wants to give me shit I can guarantee you that they haven't gone through that. So nobody can disrespect me. And I just know that if I survived complete abandonment as such, then yes, I will survive anything else. Not to mention that I think that operating on the basis of survival only, I think that it's kind of a very bad way to live life. I believe in deliberatism. I believe that everything that we want to do in life has to come from through conviction. If you just do things reactively because you're obeying, you're obeying your instincts to survive, you're, nothing good is going to come out of that. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that you're staying safe wherever you are. And have a great night.
and I'll talk to you again soon. Stay strong if you're going through something really bad. If you're going through a lot of duress in life, it will pass as everything does. And things will get better. And I know that. And things will get better several orders of magnitude better. Just remain constant. Never falter. Never, never break your back over things. Never, never turn your head down to life. If I survive that, I can survive anything else.